I'd like to welcome you all to, uh, to a kind of a special Grand Rounds. Uh, this is the uh, first time, I mean, I've only been here for a couple of months. My name's uh, Sunil Rao, and uh, I'm the new director of the Division of Biostatistics in the Department of Epidemiology and Public Health. Um, we, we run our own seminar series um, in biostatistics, but we were given this sort of special opportunity by uh, Dr. Chapiznik when a, a Grand Round spot opened up, uh, and it was really a nice opportunity for us to uh, showcase biostatistics on sort of a grander scheme than, than we would typically do that. So thank, thank you all for coming. It's a real treat today. We've got a, a, a real special speaker. Um, uh, his name is Jeremy Taylor from uh, the University of Michigan. Um, he, he, what I would consider to be is sort of your consummate biostatistician. Uh, the ability of blending biostatistical methodology with uh, medical science and in informing medical science using biostatistics. Jeremy's been at the forefront of this for years. Um, and, he, and he really walks and talks what, what all of us in biostatistics try to, try to strive for. So it's, you're really in for a treat in terms of uh, the, kind of, the kind of work that he's gonna show you. I'll, I'll, I'll read some customary information on, on Jeremy that I got off his, his webpage. So he's the, he is a, a, the Pharmacia Research Professor of Biostatistics, and he's a professor, professor of uh, Radiation Oncology in the School of Medicine at the University of Michigan. Uh, he's also the director of the biostatistics core in the Cancer Center at the University of Michigan. Uh, he got his bachelor's degree in mathematics from Cambridge University and then he moved to Berkeley to do his uh, PhD in statistics. He was on faculty at uh, UCLA Department of Biostatistics for about 15 years and in, in 98 he moved to uh, the University of Michigan. Um, he's also had visiting positions in Cambridge at the University of Adelaide and in Bordeaux, France as well. Um, to, to give you an example of how his work has been recognized outside of just the field of statistics. Not only is he a fellow of the American Statistical Association, but he's, he's also a, a winner of the Mortimer Spiegelman Award from the American Public Health Association and the Michael Fry Award from the Radiation Research Society. Um, so really his, 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 his work spans a, a great deal of breadth. His research focuses on applications of statistics to cancer and AIDS, um, especially in terms of cancer radiation oncology. And he, he focuses on modeling, on survival analysis, and on uh, longitudinal data analysis. Um, his work in radiation oncology is really focused on the effect of uh, fraction size, total dose, time and volume on the biological response to radiation. And his work on cancer has focused on modeling and evaluating biomarkers, particularly PSA for prostate cancer, which is what we'll hear about today. And more recently, he's been getting into the arena that a lot of us are into, which is dealing with multiple biomarkers and how to uh, bring them to bear on, on cancer research, as well as gene expression analysis and the design of phase one uh, clinical trials in, in oncology. So it's a great pleasure to have Jeremy here. Um, I wanna make sure your talk here, so I can give you the title of the talk. Okay, so it's Individual Predictions and Validation Using Statistical Models in Prostate Cancer Studies. Welcome. All right, thank you for the... Okay, so this is, um, well, thank, thank you for a kind introduction. It seems like I got a bit to live up to here, so I'll do my best. So as Sunil said, I'm a statistician, so I'm gonna talk about some work I've, I've been doing in prostate cancer, and I'm gonna start by giving sort of an overview of sort of what, my, my perception of what models might be used for prediction models in, in medical settings and then get into some fairly details about a particular model that we've built in a particular application. And the models, or, or the models are designed for predicting a future event. So here's, here's the plan. Um, talk generally about prediction models, then talk about prostate cancer a little bit, um, talk about the motivation here, and then sort of a statistical part is for sort of how to combine longitudinal data and, and event time data and then get into particular data sets and have a website which we'll go to and play with. And then if I have time, I'll talk about sort of trying to validate the models. So what are models in, in this sort of setting? So prediction models. So I'm thinking of things which are equations or algorithms to predict something in the future and it may require quantitative input and they're going to provide quantitative output usually. So I'm thinking of giving a probability of something rather than just saying high risk, low risk. 
And so some examples, probably some of you have heard of these, Framingham risk score, you know, this gives you something about heart disease in the future. Um, Gale model predicts whether you're a carrier of a, um, no, no, predicts lifetime risk of, or risk for breast cancer of, for after, up to a certain time in your life. BRCA Pro predicts whether you're going to, whether they think you're a carrier of a BRCA mutations. Mike Catan at Cleveland Clinic's built just tons of models relating to prostate cancer risk, and he calls them nomograms. So, um, PCP calculator risk of um, prostate cancer based on various characteristics. I and mean, then Oncotype would be another sort of model where so gene expression data gets fed in and it's sort of a prognosis model for um, breast cancer disease recurrence. So, so lots and lots, hundreds and hundreds of examples out there on the web. Um, so this is sort of a type of model I'm thinking of. So there's input required and they predict something about you, about the future. So most of these models give probabilities. So they say 20% risk of heart disease, something like that, or 80%. So that's, that's sort of the extent they go. They don't tell you what to do necessarily. They just give you a, a probability or put you in a category. So, they, you know, so that's supposed to be the aid to decision making. It's not telling you what to do, but just summarizing information in terms of a probability. And they don't need to be mathematically simple. I mean, if it's on a website. You really don't know what's going on behind there. And some of them are simple and some of them aren't simple. And so they don't need to be. And in fact, probably simple ones aren't necessarily the best. They most are prognostic in the sense that they're just giving you the risk of something. They're telling you, you know, under a standard f procedure, standard follow-up, you know, what's the prognosis. But some of them are what are called predictive, so that's a little bit in involving treatment. What would the outcome be if you took this treatment? What would the outcome be if you took that treatment? So those, that would be sort of predictive models, so they're all predicting something. So most of them are cross-sectional in the sense that you collect a sort of a cross-section of data now and you predict something in the future. Um, so the one I'm going to, and most of you use current information, so the one I'm going to talk about, what we built, sort of builds in changes in PSA, a lab marker. So you can imagine an improved version of Framingham which built in, you know, your history of blood pressure over the last 10 years, and that might be added information. So there aren't too many models which build in history, because for no reason it's a lot harder to do, but that's what we're going to be trying to do. Um, and most models just consider one outcome. You know, so that, you know, there might be toxicity outcomes, there might be efficacy type outcomes, so putting them all together is a more complicated sort of decision process, but most models tend to just focus on one outcome at a time and let you sort of deal with the different outcomes and make judgments on that. So what, what are they? They're, to my mind, they're just taking data, trying to produce evidence from that data in a quantitative way. And so it's sort of what physicians and healthcare providers do anyway. They take for framing and risk score. You'd look at the blood pressure, you'd look at the age, look at the smoking history, filter in your mind and make a decision or make a sort of categorization. So these are just sort of evidence-based ways of taking data, coming up with quantitative probabilities associated with future events. And they're for use by healthcare providers or for the patients. And then another use is clearly an entry criteria for studies. If you're at high risk for something, you're more likely to be in a sort of a research setting enrolled in a study. So the inputs can be simple. So framing them would be a simple input. Um, they can be more complex, like BRCA Pro requires family history of breast and maybe even ovarian cancer, I'm not sure. So there's sort of different levels of complication. And simple is, is good if you want people to use it. It's not necessarily ideal if you want the model to be as good as it can be. So sort of dumbing it down might make more people use it, but probably the quality of a prediction is going to be less good. So, um, and so you have to build these models and you have to sort of check they work. So there's model building. So there's you know, sort of developing um, equations, algorithms, whatever. So usually you need a big training set, big set of data to do that with. And then you have to validate them, and there's different styles of validation, internal validation. So if you build a model on the same, if you try to validate a model on the same data you, look, you built it from, there's dangers in doing that. The model will look better than it really will be on the next data set. There's some, what you can actually do it using cross-validation and do it correctly, but it's hard. But so the best thing is take another data set, does it work on the next data set, collect a different institution, 
So that's, that's perfect. So both of those are statistical tasks and they're not, not necessarily easy. Okay, so that was sort of a general scheme of sort of the outline of style of models I'm talking about. So now a little bit about prostate cancer before we get into the very specifics of a model I've talked about, I'm gonna, gonna present. So many of you probably know quite a bit of, about prostate cancer or a general awareness of prostate cancer. It's common cancer for older men. Um, it's one of the more slower growing cancers. In fact, I don't know, most people who get prostate cancer die of something else. So it's not one of the most aggressive cancers, but a serious problem, a lot of people get metastasis, it's, it's, it's not good news. Um, the treatments for localized disease are radiation therapy, surgery, or we, more, more more these days, watchful waiting. And so I'm, what I'm gonna be talking about is only the situation of people who get radiation therapy. So I've got a model for that setting for patients who got radiation therapy without hormones at the same time. And prostate cancer is a situation where there's actually quite a reasonable biomarker for monitoring patients. So PSA is prostate-specific antigen, and that's controversial in the setting of screening for prostate cancer, but in the, in the setting of monitoring patients after treatment, it's far more accepted and reliable and used, and that was actually what it was approved for by the FDA to start with. And so, it, you know, growing PSA, high, increasing values of PSA reflects increasing tumor volume, basically, in, in the patient to some degree. And so that's, that's a useful marker and used all the time. I and mean, it's, it's used so much as definitions of endpoints based on PSA, things like um, three consecutive rises, sort of ad hoc rules for what, PS, what the pattern of PSA looks like announced by a chemical recurrence if it's going up fast or to a certain level. So, but but it's, not, it's a lab test, it doesn't have symptoms, it's, so it's not a real thing. So what real thing would be recurrence, the cancer coming back, and that could be coming back locally or distantly or regionally. And for purposes of today, I'm just pooling all those together, local, regional, distant, as evidence that the cancer comes back. So PSA isn't a real thing, but it's certainly gonna be useful in, in this setting. So this, the model is all about gonna be using PSA to help predict the clinical recurrence. So here's data from, from patients. And so you'll see a few plots like this. So the vertical axis is PSA on a log scale, and the horizontal axis is um, time from the end of radiation therapy. And, and so as many years of follow-up here, and the typical pattern of PSA is it comes down about a year, and then it maybe stays down, which would be sort of a lower graph, or it starts to rise. And if it starts to rise, it's sort of an indication of cancer may be coming back. There's no detectable cancer for these patients, but that's sort of a pattern. And another thing to notice is that, you know, it doesn't start to rise and then gradually, you know, super accelerate or drop to zero. Once it's sort of rising, it tends to go on rising. So it's a fairly predictable, which is actually an important feature for the models. Okay, so the goal here is to develop a, a website which can, a patient like, like the patient at the top here, who has a rising pattern of PSA is almost certainly getting quite anxious about whether the cancer is going to come back. So they can go to this website, enter their data, and get some sort of prediction of what's likely to happen in the future based on their data and their characteristics. And so there's this website. 